Welcome to the Sabbath. Thanks for joining me tonight. This is going to be the last Torah portion of the year. This is the grand finale tonight. We are closing up the book of Deuteronomy, ending the Torah. But what's amazing about this particular Torah reading is that it's almost the beginning of the next Torah reading, which is we start over again, praise God. Well, anyway, the word for tonight is Vazut Habraka. Vezut Habraka. We find this in Deuteronomy chapter 33 and verse 1. And this is the blessing. There's that word right there. This is the blessing. Vezut Habraka. This is the blessing. This is blessing night. Aren't you glad you showed up for the blessing night? This is the blessing night. And this is the blessing wherewith Moses, the man of God, blessed the children of Israel before his death. Before his death. This is Moses' last blessing. And he knew he was going to die. And so I guarantee you, he put a great blessing on the children of Israel. So, this is the blessing. These are the first words of Deuteronomy 33, 1. And this Torah portion is uh, ordinarily read on the day of Simchat Torah, which means rejoicing in the Torah. Rejoicing in the Torah. It's in conjunction with the beginning starting over in the book of Genesis, to mark the conclusion of one year's Torah cycle and the beginning of the next. The portion contains Moses' final blessing over the 12 tribes, the story of his ascent up to Mount Nebo to overlook the land of Canaan, and the story of his death and his burial. All right, some of the scriptures that we're going to uh, refer to or talk about tonight, it, of course, is Deuteronomy 33, 1, and this is the blessing. This is Moses' final blessing over Israel. Deuteronomy 34, this is where Moses dies and he is buried in the land of Moab. And so um, we'll get to that in a little bit. Now, out of the prophets, we're going to read this uh, portion tonight. Joshua chapter 1 verse 1, God commissions Joshua. And now we have the leadership is being handed over from Moses to Joshua. Moses dies and God raises up another leader. And then Joshua 1.10, he prepares for the invasion, going in to take the promised land. This is the blessing. This is the blessing going on into the promised land. How many wants to make it into the promised land? Along about this time every year, we could expect the return of the Lord. Right around the Day of Atonement and the Feast of Tabernacles, we are anticipating Yeshua, our Messiah, fulfilling these final three feasts. Oh, what a glorious day that Yeshua will take us on in to the promised land. Joshua, Yahshua, do you get the picture here? Moses brought him out of Egypt. Yahshua takes him into the promised land. Moses brought us the Torah. Yeshua brought us the fulfillment of that Torah. Praise God. And then in the Gospels, we're going to, well, I'll refer to it a little bit, but it's Luke 22, 44 through 53. Here is Yeshua in his final moments, his final blessing. He comes back out of the garden and he finds his disciples asleep. <coughs> Yeshua is in his final moments. <coughs> He knows he's about to go to the cross. He knows he's ready to die. And here's his disciples, the ones that he has trained all this time. There they are sleeping. And he says to them, could you not pray with me one hour, especially this hour where they're coming, the betrayer is coming to get me. <clears throat> but Yeshua went back, prayed again. 
said, Lord, if this cup could pass from me, no different than Moses. Moses begged to be able to go into the promised land, but God would not let him go. Yeshua said, let this cup pass from me. He didn't want to go to this death. He didn't want to be beaten and 39 stripes and a spear in his side and a crown of thorns on his head. I mean, obviously, he had some physical attributes going on here that said, this is going to hurt. But he said, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Aren't you glad that our Yeshua says, this is the blessing. Here comes the blessing. I'm going to die for you. I'm going to pay the price for you. And I'm going to bring you into the promised land. Praise God. All right. I want to talk to you about the resurrection of Moses. This is, uh, you're not going to get this just kind of browsing through this. So let me just give you some scriptures here and an overview of this. Why was Moses buried outside the promised land? So that when the resurrection of the dead comes, he can lead his generation across the Jordan. Quite a statement. Let's look at it. When Moses blessed the tribe of Gad, he said, He provided the first part for himself, for there the ruler's portion was reserved, and he came with the leaders of the people. He executed the justice of the Lord and his ordinance with Israel. Deuteronomy 33:21. Who is the he in this blessing? Well, tradition applies these descriptions to Moses himself. The tribe of Gad settled in the Transjordan. The sages understood the obscure words, for there the ruler's portion was reserved, to refer to the grave of Moses, Deuteronomy 33:21. The Talmud says that the ruler's portion in Gad is the burial plot of Moses. Very interesting. Now, though Mount Nebo was located in the territory of Reuben, the sages imagined that the angels carried Moses into the adjacent territory of Gad for burial. Moreover, the Midrash interprets Deuteronomy 33:21, he came at the head of the people to mean that Moses will lead his generation across the Jordan and into the land of Israel at the time of the resurrection of the dead. This is why the Lord did not allow Moses to cross the Jordan. He needed Moses to stay with his generation so that his merit and favor could save the generation that he buried in the wilderness. This is very interesting, you see. Moses said that in the future, that God was going to raise up another prophet like unto me, and him you shall shema, hear and obey. Moses was this first prophet. He brought the children out. He gave them the Torah. Yeshua becomes this other prophet that leads another generation into the promised land. So Moses could not go into the promised land because of all the dead that died in the wilderness. One day, all the dead will be raised. I've got uh, a lot of teaching on that in the future. But I saw the dead, small and great, stand before the throne. And of course, Moses is going to be the head of that tribe. He was the ruler over those people. All right. Lest people suppose that the generation that fell in the wilderness has no share in the world to come, you must be buried beside them. Then in the time to come, you shall enter with them. It says in Numbers, for there the ruler's portion was reserved and he came at the head of the people. Again, Numbers 19 and 13. Now, the generation of Moses would merit to partake in the resurrection only due to Moses being buried on the east bank of the Jordan, just as they were. Moses identified himself as one with the people, and the Lord referred to Israel as the people 
of Moses. I always used to kind of joke about that. When they were doing good, the people were doing God, good, God always said, they're my people. And then they weren't doing good. He always said, Moses, your people have sinned. Well, anyway, uh, the people of Moses, as it says in Exodus 32, 7, go down at once for your people have sinned. Now, there's notes that the operative word here is your people, such as that in order to save his people at the time of the resurrection, Moses had to die here and now. Interesting understanding. And we thank the sages, the rabbis, etc., that has carried on this understanding throughout the generations. Now, just simply compare this legend about Moses and Yeshua, our Messiah who also died in order to save Israel in the future resurrection. He took the first part for himself. He was the first raised from the dead. In the future, he will come at the head of the resurrection, leading his people into the land of Israel like a king at the head of his army. How many knows that he's probably not coming back to Sandusky um, he'll get us. He'll not forget us up here in Sandusky, but I guarantee you he's coming back to Jerusalem and Israel. Praise God. But thank God we're grafted in, and so we're a part of this great resurrection. All right, the book of glory. This word glory, I have heard it used throughout my 35, 40 years in the ministry and in the church world. I've heard preachers say the glory cloud rolled in. I've heard, oh, the glory's here. The glory fell. Uh, the glory was so thick we couldn't even stand to minister. The glory, you know, glory, glory, glory. I mean, I've heard that word so many times. But the book of glory, interesting. The Torah contains the revelation of God's glory the knowledge of Yahovah. Prior to the revelation through Moses, human beings might have deduced the existence of a creator, but our knowledge of that creator would be limited uh, from observation. We, we wouldn't know what our creator looked like. But Moses introduced God to the people. The Lord disclosed himself to his creation through Moses. When God revealed himself to mankind through the revelation of his Torah, it was as if he declared, allow me to introduce myself. I am God. <laughs> the, the Torah is the glory of God. We see the glory of God revealed through the Torah. So the revelation of God is called the glory of God. Let me introduce myself. I am God. Hmm. We see God through revelation of God. It's, it's not that we're trying to physically see him. We see him when he is revealed to us. The revelation of God is the glory of God. Now, to glorify God means to accurately reveal God's true person to someone else. How would I glorify God? Well, I reveal God to someone else. When someone else sees God, I have therefore glorified God. So show me Moses then in Exodus 33, 18, Moses says, show me your glory. Now that's a bold statement. I mean, he didn't ask. He said, show me your glory. Wow. In other words, show me who you really are. Reveal yourself to me. So the Torah becomes the book of glory. How did God reveal himself to Moses? 
through the book, through the Ten Commandments, through the tablets of stone. Right through those tablets of stone was the glory of God. The finger of God wrote those commandments on those tablets of stone. Wow. God hid Moses in the cleft of the rock and he went by him and he said, you can only see my, the backside of me because no one could see my face and live. The glory of God. The Bible says when Yahovah returns to the earth in the Revelation, Revelation 20, I believe it is, when he comes into the earth, heaven and earth flees away. My, if heaven and earth is going to flee away, I guarantee you we better have a glorified body by then or we'll be fleeing away also. No, our creator is much higher, much more amazing than we can even see with our natural eyes. He is spirit. He is the creator. He is energy. He is mind, will, emotions, wisdom. How do we see him? Revelation through the Torah. When we read the scriptures, the scriptures come alive and the glory of God is revealed to us. When we receive an insight about God or see an accurate depiction of God's person, we perceive a little bit of the glory of God. The revelation of the glory of God is also called the knowledge of the Lord. The scripture says that there will come a time when the whole earth will be filled with his glory. No, the knowledge of his glory. Mm. See, we want something like a Shekinah glory. We want a cloud to roll in. We want some physical manifestation. We want, well, we're flesh. And so we always want to touch something. We always want it to be in the natural. And yet God is so supernatural. <laughs> well, when we see him, we'll be like him. As for now, we go from what? Glory to glory. What's that mean? We see a little more of the revelation of God, and then we see a little more of the revelation of God, and, and we see a little bit more of who he is. God says, let me introduce myself. I am God. I am the God that brings you out of Egypt and out of the house of bondage. Don't have any of the gods before me. I'm your provider. I'm your healer. I'm your deliverer. I'm your soon coming king. I'm, oh, he's everything. And we just learn a little bit about the glory when we read a few scriptures or two. Well, anyway, the Lord reveals his glory through the whole book, through the Torah, through the prophets, through the writings, through the gospels, through the epistles, through the revelation, the apocalypse, the unveiling, the pulling the blinders back so that we can see him. Who is he? He's the creator. He's the judge. He's the redeemer. He is alpha and omega. He's beginning and end. He is everything in between. He hung the stars in the sky. He Wow. How many want to get a glimpse of his glory? Or are you getting a glimpse of his glory right now? 1 Corinthians 13, 12, I think Paul really summed it up when he said this, for now we see in a mirror dimly. We look through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully just as I also have been fully known. But now faith, hope, and love, these three abide. The greatest is love. What's the glory of God? Well, God is love. What's love? Well, when you're that nasty sinner, he sent his son to die for you. 
When you were in trouble, he reached out. Behold the hand, behold the nail. When you're crying out to him, he helps you. He delivers you. He's a righteous judge. He will reward you and he will bless you. Oh, yeah. This is the blessing. Is that what we're talking about? This is the blessing. What's the blessing? To know God. That's the blessing. To know who he is, to know what he is, to know why he is, to know what he does. The glory of God. Now, these same five verbs describe the Messianic era, a day in which the Almighty will pour out his spirit on all flesh, so that even the least of the least will receive a revelation of God on par with his greatest prophets in this current era. In that day, no man will need to teach his neighbor about God. No preacher will need to say, know ye the Lord. They will all know him from the least to the greatest, and the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as waters cover the sea. But for now, we look through a glass darkly. For now, we go line upon line, precept upon precept. From now, we go from faith to faith and from glory to glory. How many is enjoying the journey? I'll tell you, I, I know God a whole lot better than I knew him when I first started this journey. It's fun finding out who he is and how he is and everything about him. And it's, it's our joy to seek it out. It's our joy to find him. It's our joy to ding, the light goes on and we, ah, oh, what an awesome God he is. Oh, it's a beautiful thing. All right, last thing I want to talk about before we get into Joshua here is uh, Simchat Torah. On the same day that we finish reading the Torah, we begin it again, starting in Genesis. So no sooner do we conclude the book of Deuteronomy than the scroll is rewound and we begin reading of the book of Genesis. The celebration which accompanies the ending and the beginning of the Torah reading is called Simchat Torah, which means rejoicing in the Torah. It is traditionally done on the eighth day, Shemini at Zaret, after the seven days of the Feast of Sukkot, or the Feast of Tabernacles. And this is uh, when this Torah portion ends. Now, you know, this year we, we just keep doing this on, on the Sabbath every time. And so uh, we personally will we'll do this in our local church setting. But I wanted to make sure that you were able to do it at your home. So why is this called rejoicing in the Torah? As the Torah itself was doing the rejoicing. I mean, the Torah is rejoicing. Uh, how can the Torah be rejoicing? Well, in some sense, it seems as if the Torah does rejoice on this day. In the synagogue, it's traditional to take the Torah in one's arms and dance through the aisles with it. Congregants become the legs and the feet of the scroll as they dance through the assembly. Now, what is the Torah? Well, it's the glory of God. What is the Torah? Well, it's the rain from heaven. What is the Torah? It's the word of God. What is the Torah? The instructions of God. What is the Torah? Let me introduce myself to you. We rejoice in it, and yet the Torah rejoices. Can I say that God, when he gets in you, he rejoices in you. When you dance, he dances. When you rejoice, he rejoices. Because it's his word that is in you. We rejoice in the Torah. Now, at the end of the book of Deuteronomy, we read the story of how Moses, 
the first redeemer, if I could say that, and the foreshadowing type of Messiah to come, Yeshua, he finally dies. After 120 years, he sees the promised land from the heights of Mount Nebo, and then he dies. Regarding his death, the Torah tells us that God himself buried the body of Moses. The Midrash uh, imagines God coaxing Moses' soul forth from his body. Uh, Deuteronomy 11.10, it says, Thereupon God kissed Moses and took away his soul with a kiss of the mouth. He took away his soul with the kiss of the mouth. When I first read that, I thought that was the way it was when I first kissed my wife. She just took my soul right there. Amen. <laughs> it's an interesting phrase here. Yet before we have even had time to properly grieve the death of Moses, who was a pattern of the Messiah to come, we rewind the scroll of the Torah and read the narrative of a new beginning, a new creature, a new creation, a new heaven and a new earth, a new man, Adam, into whom God breathes the soul life or the breath of life. In other words, the kiss of death and the kiss of life are delivered from the same mouth. Wow. A pattern is established. The ending, tav, in Hebrew, gives way to the beginning, aleph. He is the beginning and the end, the aleph and the tav. Death gives way to life. Wow. With God, the end is is the new beginning. Isn't the Torah amazing? Isn't the glory of God amazing? God kisses Moses. He takes his soul and yet starts a new beginning. In death starts the promised land because the very next thing we see is the children of Israel go on into the promised land. Jesus on the cross, he said, it is finished, death. But yet before he said that to the guy on the cross next to him, he said, this day you will be with me in paradise. It is finished, and yet it has really just begun. Wow. As soon as he died on the cross, the new covenant went into effect. The kiss of death was also the breath of life. Jesus gave up the ghost. He breathed his last breath, and yet with that, his soul, his spirit, was immediately in the presence of God. That's the same way with us. We do not have to fear death. It's a beautiful thing. We don't have to fear death, because death is really our new beginning. Wow. Paul said, I finished my course. I've kept the faith. And now I look forward to a reward. This is the blessing. This is the blessing. We rejoice in the Torah because Revelation 1, 17 and 18 says, He who is the, the eternal word, the goal of the Torah, and the first and the last has declared, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last and the living one. I was dead and behold, I am alive forever." more. This is rejoicing in the Torah. Oh, thank God. <laughs> to some, death is a scary thing. To you as a believer in Yeshua, and you've made him the Lord of your life, death is really the beginning of a brand new life, an eternal life, a God kind of life, where we will see him as he is. And we really will be able to hear God say, let me introduce myself. Welcome into my kingdom. Enter into the kingdom. Blessed are you forevermore. We look forward to that. And just like Joshua, and we turn the page, and now after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke unto Joshua. 
He said, Moses, my servant is dead. Therefore arise, go over this Jordan, thou and all this people unto the land which I do give to them, even to the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that I have given unto you, as I said unto Moses. So be strong, be of good courage. Don't look to the right or to the left, but march on straight ahead and and he, oh, and then he says, this book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. Uh-oh. Joshua obviously took the Torah with him and let it become life in his life. Just like I tell you, let the word become life in your life. And then we will be able to one day with Yeshua at the marriage of the Lamb. He once again will raise the cup and he will raise the bread and we'll have the greatest Sabbath that we have ever had in our entire lives. And the good news is that Sabbath will last for a thousand years. Well, this is the end of the Torah, but well, actually, we've just begun, haven't we? God bless you tonight. I thank you for all year long going through each Torah portion. And then we'll, we'll begin again next week with Genesis and starting out this again. But I guarantee you, you will hear new things every time because God will say, let me introduce myself. Take the bread, take the cup, and look forward to your new beginning. God bless you. Let this word become life in your life. Happy Sabbath. <laughs>